across the land and in our deep seas. An army of people is working flat out to meet our energy demands. We are fundamentally splitting the atom. This is the story of those at the sharp end of the power industry. Energy production is changing. In this series, we find out how it works. When you are trying to achieve two thousandths of an inch on something that weighs 80 or 90 tonnes, that's what sorts the men from the boys. From nuclear energy and offshore gas, to biomass and harnessing the wind, it's energy production on an epic scale. At one point, there will be over 10,000 people working on this project. In this episode, I'm at Britain's biggest generating plant as it reinvents itself and ends decades of burning coal. This is how our power is made. Not far from the Yorkshire town of Selby, an unusual guided tour is about to take place. There are plenty of visitor attractions in the north of England, but this has got to be the most unusual. Drax Power Station makes 5% of Britain's electricity, powering around 6 million homes. The energy comes from burning compressed wood pellets known as biomass which creates steam that drives a set of huge turbines. I'm Keely Donovan, and like many people, I take where my electricity comes from for granted. So, it's time to take a closer look. Hello, is this the 12 o'clock tour? Yes, it is. Can I join you? Of course. Thank you. Each year, 12,000 people take a tour of Drax, often with guide Jane Breach. Why do you think people want to come on these tours? It's a fascination with the power station. It's such a huge, iconic station, and people are interested in the engineering, they're interested in the architecture, they're interested in the past, and, of course, they're interested in the future. Now, as we turn down here, you're going to see some really big pipes. They're huge. They're nine metres in diameter. Did you know they're bigger than the Channel Tunnel? Ooh. In her six years here, Jane's become a bit of a power station encyclopedia. What are people generally most amazed about? What facts do you give them that you get lots of wows for? The size, so the fact that we can hide the Statue of Liberty in a cooling tower, should we want to? Even just the sheer size of the site, you know, nearly 2,000 acres, it's, it's quite a big site. Do you enjoy it? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love talking about it. I'm a bit of a power station geek, truth <laughs> be told, so I love talking about it. <laughs> Have you ever had any unusual questions or requests? The most unusual request was the uh, request to get married on site. No. Yes. Uh, Could they? Unfortunately, we can't because we're not registered, although one of the guides is a registrar, so she was quite up for doing it. So nearly. It. Someone nearly, nearly, nearly yes. got married on site. <laughs> Drax was one of a series of large power stations that were built right in the heart of the Yorkshire coalfield. Fossil fuels were seen as part of the long-term solution to Britain's rising energy needs. Construction started at Drax in the late 1960s, and as this Tomorrow's World programme showed, the building work was right out of the space age. This is the Apollo moon port, the launching pad for America's manned mission to the moon. The resonant driver, which has now come to Britain, is an American invention. It was used here at Cape Kennedy for the construction of the Apollo Instrument Testing Building. If it was good enough for NASA, it was good enough for Drax, with the high-tech pile drivers speeding up the building work. The principle of this new pile driver is that the pile is vibrated up and down very, very quickly at about 100 times per second. Now, this is faster than the eye or the camera can see. And to declare this chimney well and truly topped out. When it came on stream in 1974, 
this was the most advanced and efficient coal-fired power station in the UK. And by the mid-1980s, it had doubled in size to become the largest in the country. For much of Drax's history, coal powered its six turbines, but high carbon emissions led to it being dubbed the most polluting in Britain. These days, the UK is increasingly going coal-free, and there have been big changes at Drax too. In 2013, a new fuel came on stream. Four of its boilers now burn biomass, a wood product that comes from commercial forests in North America. Biomass is controversial. Drax says it's cleaner than coal and a renewable fuel source, but critics say burning wood on this scale just doesn't stack up. Around 90 biomass trains arrive at Drax every week, each one bringing 1,600 tonnes of fuel. And it's Duncan Mouncey and his team who make sure it's unloaded safely. Presumably, there are lots of considerations when you're transporting and moving this, because it's not coal, is it? It can't just be left outside. No, you're right. Coal can just be brought in and left outside. Not, not really a concern. Biomass, we do have to look after it. It's a, it's a lot more susceptible to moisture. Um, a lot of the wagons that are, all the wagons that we have have all got sealed doors on top, so just to keep them completely dry. It's obviously flammable, so um, wood always wants to burn. So all the plant we have to look after, we have to maintain it really well to make sure that uh, we don't have any issues. Precious cargo, this then? It is. It is a precious cargo. We treat it uh, almost as, uh, as much as gold, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I might keep this then. <laughs> The biomass trains drop their fuel whilst on the move, keeping process operators like Howard Moat on their toes. We've got to be visual when we're watching the trains through because they come through at roughly about 0.3 mile an hour and then uh, we can adjust the speed accordingly to the nature of the product. Some product flows quicker than, than others. The train doesn't stop unless we need to stop it for some reason. You must have to work quickly if that train's moving. Well, it's moving, but it's not like an express train <laughs> going through the, uh, the station. Howard's been at Drax for 35 years. He used to work in the stores. Now, part of his job is to walk the length of the biomass conveyor belt system. The conveyors that we've got are about 3.2 miles long of conveyors. So and you're walking up and down there. So walking up and down them, up and down the stairs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walking to the top of the domes, which on a very, very nice day, there's not a lot of places you can see York Minster and the Humber Bridge in, in one location. The biomass is stored in these enormous containers. Each one of these storage domes is big enough to fit London's Albert Hall inside, and between the four of them, they can hold 300,000 tonnes of pellets. That's enough to power all the homes in Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester and Liverpool for 12 days. Everything about this power station is huge. The main chimney is more than 800 feet high and there's enough steel tubing in the buildings to run the length of the UK twice. Power production happens in a vast complex housing the boilers and turbines, and this is how they work. Biomass is burnt in the boilers, which heats water to 568 degrees Celsius. Steam is then pushed through a number of turbines at various pressures. The turbine blades rotate at 3,000 revolutions per minute, which in turn spins a generator at a frequency of 50 hertz, producing the electricity that's fed into our homes. But all this equipment takes a lot of looking after. A major maintenance operation called an outage is underway. Turbine 2 and its boiler will be turned off for months. One of those in the thick of it is Michelle Desmond, who's one of Drax's engineers. So what exactly is your job here then? So I do outage coordination. So when we take one of the units off, it's uh, for a short period of time. We've got to maximise that period of time offload. So we've got to coordinate lots of activities for repair and refurbishment. And with the kit turned off, Michelle can access the boiler on Turbine 2. It's a remarkable place that's rarely seen. 
This is one of the entrances into the upper furnace. Uh, the furnace on Unit 2 is where the biomass comes in to get burnt and obviously the water is, is in the tubes to be able to get heated to steam. It's a super-sized operation. The whole boiler house is around 70 metres in total. That would fit about a Nelson's column in there. But getting inside the boiler isn't straightforward. Similar boiler doors across the, uh, the unit, you figure out your way, different ways of getting inside. Some are legs first, some are head first. That one's head first. Each boiler weighs around 4,000 tonnes and is as tall as a 15-storey building. It's a complex network of pipes designed to maximise the production of steam. If the boiler was in action, this would be a raging inferno of heat. We'd be just above the fireball here. Um, we're trying to heat the pendants here to 568 degrees, so, yeah, we wouldn't be stood here for very long. <laughs> There is 363 tubes across the front wall and uh, 363 tubes across the back wall as well. Um, the materials in here range from anything from carbon steel all the way up to stainless steel. If we were to take all the tubing that's inside the boiler and let it end to end, it's probably in excess of 300 miles. That's just one boiler and there are six of them at Drax. The outage is the biggest ever undertaken at the power station. Much of the 40-year-old turbine will be replaced or refurbished. And for Mark Simmons, it's a job that's been two years in the planning. We want to make the turbines as efficient as we can. Obviously, we're now burning biomass. The less we can burn and the more energy we can get out of them, the better. So the sooner we get the job done, it makes more people happy. You can only really appreciate how big things are by standing next to the equipment. This is one of the old turbines that's been taken out, and look at it, it's huge. There are 1,900 of these blades, and when it was working, it would spin at 50 times per second. It also produced more than a million horsepower, which is the equivalent of more than 1,200 Formula One cars. Pretty impressive, eh? The outage on Unit 2 has a long way to go. Luke Varley and his engineering team will have to work with incredible precision. The machinery um, is, as you can see, quite robust. So there is best part of 90 tonnes worth of generator rotor and probably best part of five tonnes worth of electrical excitation. And we've got to try to manoeuvre those two shafts around against one another to try to align those faces both on the outer diameter and on the faces um, so and trying to achieve a tolerance of less than a hair's thickness um, is it, tricky the problem we've got is if we don't get these two elements perfectly aligned when we spin this machine up to 3000 revs per minute the actual unbalance that that misalignment will cause will prevent this machine from coming to service because we have a, a protection system that governs the shaft line, and if it sees a level of vibration that is outside its permissible tolerance, it will shut the machine down. Engineers will be working round the clock to get Unit 2 back in action. In the energy business, time is money. Drax dominates the skyline. Its 12 enormous cooling towers can be seen from miles away. Each tower is 114 metres tall, 86 metres wide at its base and 53 metres wide at the top. They're made from reinforced concrete and help turn steam from the generating process back into water. What you can see coming out of the top is just 2% of the steam that enters the cooling tower. The rest falls to the ground as water and is collected and used again. It's only when you peek inside that you realise just how unusual they are, especially when you think that the walls are, on average, just seven inches thick. They're a marvel of engineering, 
and proved to be a bit of an inspiration for one young boy when the station was being built. I was in school at Salby, just five miles down the road, and I was building the second half of the station, and every day, rather than um, watching my maths tutor, I was watching him build the cooling towers. Rather than follow his schoolmates down the pit, Andy Storr chose Drax and an apprenticeship with the Central Electricity Generating Board. Drax was built as a very good station. Um, lots of development work had been done prior to it going onto the drawing board. Um, so Drax back then was the Rolls Royce of the CGB fleet. Andy manages the machine workshop. Not only do they fix equipment, they also manufacture tools and spares of all sorts of sizes. We can be making big fasteners like this one here. This is a steam turbine casing bolt that, that pulls both halves of the casing together, made from a, a fancy alloy. So sometimes we might have, have that to make as large as that. Or we can be making small screws um, like that there. That is a small grub screw out of the generator. So we, we cover a vast range of spares, um, both big and small. A normal piece of printing paper is three thousandths of an inch thick, so we're working to a third of the thickness of a piece of paper. Although a thousandth of an inch on something small is easy to achieve when you are trying to achieve two thousandths of an inch on something that weighs 80 or 90 tonnes, that's what sorts the men from the boys. Drax has played its part in keeping the lights on in Britain for more than 40 years. But our relationship with electricity goes back much further than that. Today, the country's power needs are managed by the national grid. But the network of pylons and wires go back to just after the Second World War. Near St Paul's Cathedral is the national control centre of the British Electricity Authority, where constant watch is kept on consumption and output and measures taken to keep the wheels turning and the lights burning during the critical peak periods of early morning and early evening. They were trying to balance the needs of a population who'd fallen in love with everything electric. That balancing act still takes place, but these days the generating mix is much more diverse and is overseen by Ro Quinn, who's the head of the National Grid ESO control room. We are like the air traffic control of the electricity system. We make sure the power can get from wherever it's generated to wherever it needs to be consumed. And we manage that at real time, second by second, uh, to make sure the electricity can move across the system to wherever it is that you need it. What you can see behind us is what we call our map board. So the really big part of it is a map of Great Britain, but tipped on its side. So we have Scotland, uh, England and Wales and then down to the south coast and the different colours tell us about the different wires and cables that make up the system and helps us get an immediate picture of, of what's going on. The amount of electricity being consumed ebbs and flows during the day as people get up, go to work and return home. We'll be looking to what we call darkness peak, which is when it starts to get dark. We all get home from work, from school, start to turn on the lights, start to make tea, start to do a few of the household chores. And that demand over the winter is always really driven by uh, industry, obviously, but also domestic activity. How are you heating your home? What lights do you have on? Um, and then it will start to look at what's on TV and uh, what programmes people will be watching together and what's your behaviour at the halftime break. These are known as TV pickups when we tune in to a big programme or national event. Some, like royal weddings, are predictable, others less so, as Amy Veltevreden remembers from 2013 when Andy Murray won Wimbledon for the first time. What we saw during July 2013 when Andy won was we've got a historic sort of trend of demand and generally that was playing out. But at the end of the first set, we suddenly got a, a pickup of 300 megawatts, which is the equivalent of around 100,000 kettles being turned on. And we had to make sure that we instructed the right amount of generation to respond quickly to meet that demand. 
as the game went on, a similar thing happened at the end of the second set. And then we all sort of started to get excited. Lots of people sat down to tune in. We really saw demand drop off as they didn't do their usual activities. At the end of the game, when we won, we got a 1600 megawatt pickup. So we had to instruct lots of units across the country, a range of pump storage, uh, fast acting generation and steam generation to make sure that we could match that supply and demand and that the rest of the nation continued with their day, celebrating the win. Back at Drax Power Station, they've got their own drama going on. This is the generator core that's been removed during the outage on Turbine 2. It's going to be refurbished and used as a spare. It weighs 300 tonnes, but in this huge turbine hall, it looks tiny. It's going to be moved just a few hundred yards by crane, and it's Mark Simmons' job to make sure it all goes smoothly. The stator core is actually 300 tonnes. The overhead cranes that we have here at Drax only can carry 150 tonnes, so there is a problem. So what we have to do, we have to couple two cranes together to essentially form one crane, use both cranes to lift the, the car at, at the same time. It is a massive job. It's only actually the second time we've done it in 16 years. Are you nervous about this? A little bit, and reason being that there's all, we've only got seven of these on site, six are in use, and this is the only spare. And it's not something that you can go to the stars and say, can I have one of those cars? There's a lot riding on this going well. No one wants to see a 300 ton object come crashing to the floor. Now we're gonna do a bit of a trial lift, make sure it's working okay, make sure the lift is gonna work fine. We'll rotate the car 180 degrees, and then we'll go ahead with a lift. Inch by inch, the core gets off the ground as Drax's cranes take the strain. OK, so we're now ready to go. The guys are going and making sure that all areas are clear above, below where the crane's going to be moving. And as you can see, it's a huge bit of kit. 300 tonnes is about to be lifted, so it's quite a, a nerve-wracking time at the moment. Refurbishment will happen in what's known as a clean condition workshop, but it'll have to go in through the roof. The margins for error are tiny. It's the end of months of planning and a chance to finally relax. Everybody's happy. It's been a great success. I'm sure a couple of the guys will be having a few beers later on tonight. I'll be having a cup of tea. But the work at Drax never stops. As the generator core gets ready for refurbishment, the boiler and turbine on Unit 2 are about to come back to life. The outage has been a mammoth operation. It's cost more than £50 million and involved more than 1,000 contractors, and the boiler and turbine have been offline for four months. Hey, well, that's steam to set, mate. The Drax control room is responsible for getting the turbine up and running and connected to the grid. For Chris Summers and his team, the heat is on. It's not been without its challenges. 
the, uh, sometimes they take a bit of kick-starting like your old cars. We've, uh, this one's certainly been a, a long outage. We've been off for four months, done an awful lot of upgrades. Uh, in round about the areas, there's been a full control system upgrade. We've done upgrades on the turbine, so a high, more higher efficient machine. Boilers had extensive work, so it's, it's all just nursing it all back to life. Fuel is added to the boiler and the pressure builds up. The engineers who've taken the turbine to bits and then rebuilt it are keen to see it working again. And for engineer Luke Farley, it's a tense time. As we run the turbine to speed and as we start to load the turbine, um, it's very uh, sensitive to thermal conditions and changes in loading. Um, so we have to make sure uh, that we're not doing any damage to the bearings as we, uh, as we run it up. Just be aware, we're going to hold at 13.40 for 21 minutes. It's um, the end of a long road <laughs> and we're, uh, we just wanting to make sure that we, uh, we don't uh, take his eye off the ball at this uh, point. It's just starting to ramp now, so it's not kicked off yet. To feed power to the grid, the turbine blades need to reach 3,000 revolutions per minute. At almost the halfway point, it seems everything is working well. Yeah, machine dynamics are happy to go. You ready? And as the power is increased, a crucial moment is reached. 2,600, or just above, is um, a critical speed for the turbine. The shaft's spinning at 3,000 RPM, but the tips where the blades are probably doing 1,400 mile an hour. So it's quite a critical point of where things could quite easily um, go wrong and unravel. But once you get the bearing vibrations, will pick up naturally, and then you see them decay. So it's once you get over that hill, you can see the, uh, the run down then. With the turbine blades spinning at 3,000 RPM, the generator is producing a current of 50 hertz. There are huge forces at play. Each turbine at Drax produces more than 600 megawatts of energy. That's enough to power over a million homes. But the connection to the grid goes almost unnoticed. With just the press of a button, Unit 2 is back online. Once again, Drax is firing on all cylinders. More than 40 years ago, Drax's fortunes were firmly tied to coal. Drax will soon turn its coal boilers off for good, and in switching to biomass, the plant has pinned its long-term future on renewable energy. The power station that was once deemed the biggest polluter in Britain has seen its CO2 emissions tumble, and it plans to use new technology to be carbon negative by 2030. Drax has been powering Britain for four decades and its engineers will continue to do so for many years to come. <laughs>